Welcome back, everybody. It's hard to believe it, but we're coming to the close of our forum. And for those of you who've stayed the duration, you will know that our engagement here has been, if anything, thought-provoking. It's been such a joy to hear our success stories. I think we understand the challenges that we're facing, but to just hear the examples from all over the world of how science and technology is being practically applied to improve our agri-food systems worldwide. It has been an absolute encouraging uh, exercise. And as you told us, DG, when you opened for us yesterday, that this isn't just a conference, this is a call to action. And I sense that as you all inputted and gave contributions for the duration. We're now going to open our closing sessions, and Director General, I think it's fitting that you do that for us because we know that a lot of these technologies that we've discussed the IAEA is at the core of that, and you can do a better job at making that elaboration. So I'll hand over to you without wasting any more time. DJ Rossi, please. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, yes, uh, when we started uh, this um, uh, yesterday, uh, I tried to describe what we want to do. Um, we are not doing anything which is uh, not known uh, uh, neither on, on its necessity nor on the techniques, technologies uh, that exist um, to do that. But we still see um, a world where uh, many perfectly solvable problems are still with us. Sometimes, and especially these days, when we see so many international crises, we wonder why this is happening, and we know that uh, they are very complex and, 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 and on occasion incredibly difficult to, to solve. But what we have here in front of us is something that is absolutely within our reach. Scientifically, technologically, I would even say financially, because when we think about uh, the cost, and let's you know talk in very concrete, terms of uh, an irradiation machine or a small project um, to um, uh, uh, control pests or use the SIT technology. We are thinking about uh, figures that are uh, absolutely affordable for donors, for countries, for international organizations, which means that whatever is not being solved is because we are at some point in the chain failing to do what is necessary. We are not doing it. Hmm? Uh, we do not depend on some strategic decision being taken, but I don't know whom. We know where the problems are. We know what the tools uh, are to tackle them. Uh, so uh, this is why I was talking about uh, this as being um, a, a, a call, a renewed call for, for, for action. Uh, um, Atoms for Food uh, does not want to be a lofty, uh, unattainable sort of big project. This is why I use the word service. It's a service. It's, it's here. So um, what we want, and, and I've been discussing with uh, some of my friends here, the minister today, this morning, talking about Zimbabwe and uh, Burkina as well, uh, and, and uh, African countries, Latin American countries, um, the specificities of the situations that they are having. So what we, I would like to believe is that uh, this will have been um, a contribution to understand better, not the problem, where the problems are mm -hmm. and what are we going to do uh, about them. Uh, so uh, we, I would like, hopefully, also uh, to see and, uh, uh, and the diversity of this round table with organizations that in and by themselves are doing a lot already in the world, that partnerships are forged, that people come uh, out of this meeting uh, knowing that they are going to do something with someone whom they met here. Of course, the agency, um, and this is why we established uh, Atoms for Food. So um, I was, of course, uh, uh, following uh, in the middle of my uh, uh, meetings and, and uh, going up and down the building, seeing all the delegations, what was going on here. Um, I uh, was very, I would say, encouraged 
by what I know, and you were briefing me on, on what you were getting from this uh, day and a half of discussions. And of course, uh, I will be looking forward to hear from my, my uh, partners here at, at this uh, final uh, round table. But the idea is, like we have done with other projects at the agency, that uh, uh, as many countries as possible uh, join us. Uh, I was uh, hearing from my, my Burkina Bay partner here that you are joining uh, um, Atoms for Food. We have uh, a, a big amount of countries that have already manifested that they want to participate and some projects have, have started. So I hope at some point in a not so distant future we will see Atoms for Food already well consolidated um, among the family of efforts that are being, um, that are ongoing. Um, we don't want to dupl duplicate uh, anything, we want to add mm. uh, to what uh, is being done. And I think um, there is uh, uh, a lot of space, uh, as they say, a lot of room for improvement. Only that, lives uh, depend on that. So I wanted to thank you again for having um, responded positi positively to our idea to have this year's scientific forum talking about this, talking about the fight against uh, hunger talking about uh, food security and how we, the nuclear people, can contribute to that. So thank you very much. Thank you, DG Rossi. Thank you very much for that. And I just want to pick up with you, uh, Minister Anxious Masuko. You are representing uh, Zimbabwe here today as Minister of Land, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water, Rural <coughs> Development. Uh, you've sat through most of this conference, really engaged, and I'm wondering what your key takeaways have been. Well, thank you very much, and uh, let me start by thanking FAO and the IAEA for organizing this fantastic uh, opportunity that brings us together. It's my first attendance, and I've learned quite a lot from uh, the crop side of things, where we, from space and to mutation breeding. In Zimbabwe and the rest of Southern Africa, we are predicted to become drier in the decades ahead because of climate change. So I'm really looking forward to our officers, scientists, using some of the mutation breeding to be able to develop varieties that are suited to the drier environments that we're going to experience. Uh, that uh, also look at um, increased water use efficiency. I saw something in terms of uh, tracking for fertilizers and more efficient utilization thereof in the area of uh, animal and livestock. There's so much that we can do. We saw that uh, with uh, rinder pest has been eliminated, but there's also opportunity for uh, the sterile insect technique for cessefly elimination. Cessefly is endemic to many parts of Africa, including Zimbabwe. So I look forward to um, research continuing on this line so that uh, the communities that are impacted are able to produce livestock in these infested areas. I saw lots about uh, the food waste and loss and the role of irradiation in ensuring that uh, we can uh, in have longevity or better shelf life for bread and other things, but also that we can improve trade. So I'm looking at these multifarious opportunities that have been presented here yesterday and today in terms of the insights that we could utilize to improve food security, yeah, increase production and productivity, but concomitantly reduce uh, West, so massive opportunities that uh, I've seen today. The way forward, I think these aspects are related to the leadership that is required to drive the change that we need to, to do, the political will to do so, and um, the, the partnerships, and it starts with uh, EIA and FAO and all of us, collaboration, cooperation to ensure that within the same region, perhaps we can look at regional uh, projects that are aligned to eliminating some of the most important challenges that we face. And I have in mind uh, this uh, Tsetse control in Southern Africa. I also look at uh, capacity building, and capacity building is an important aspect, especially for uh, a small country such as Zimbabwe, but I think it starts with also the STEM and education that we need more and more of our children trained in these areas. And so the capacity building, not just at tertiary institutions, but those that are already in post. I also look at resources the resources to be able to do this, the financial resources, the infrastructure that is required to build the sustained momentum that we require to feed an increasing uh, population from a reducing 
area. So we need to increase productivity, we need to reduce our loss, but also maybe at some stage we need to look at how we can slant our diet so that we can live within the means of uh, the, the, the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency, uh, for that. His Excellency, uh, Minister Diko, your Deputy uh, Minister in the Agriculture and Animal Resources and Fisheries Ministry in Burkina Faso, your takeaways, please, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's on, yes. Okay, thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm so proud to be here. We attend a since yesterday to the scientific conference. It is the occasion to thank you for uh, your invitation to this panel. Uh, I come from uh, Burkina Faso, who is in the Sahel region of uh, Africa, and we have the uh, same reality with uh, Mali and Niger. In uh, our area, we have uh, a problem with uh, climate change, with uh, low productivity of uh, our crops, animal disease, a lot of animal disease, and uh, we are facing to this problem, and since uh, Ten here, we are facing to terrorist problem, which uh, uh, make a lot of loss in animal, in uh, uh, vegetable production. So, uh, in our with our government, we launched uh, two major initiatives for uh, food. Uh, we have a presidential initiative for food and uh, the agro pastoral fishing. Uh, for uh, food production. We are focused on rice, maize, uh, uh, animal, and uh, wheat. And the problems are, are real, and uh, here we see that uh, AIA have uh, a solution to a lot of uh, our problem. And uh, we are s collaborating with uh, your organization since uh, uh, 14 here in uh, animal uh, disease area, like uh, uh, animal African trypanosomosia and uh, CC. And it is the occasion to greet you and uh, thank you for all what you do for our country. We have uh, a lot of problem with uh, food production and we see that here we have uh, a solution that we will implement. We can't uh, solve uh, all uh, food problem in uh, our area without science and uh, innovation. So the initiative like uh, Atom for Food and uh, Zodiac initiative are welcome in uh, our area because we have uh, a now to product uh, more with uh, less land and uh, less water. So we are thank you very much for what you, you, you do for our country, our area, and we, will, uh, we need your support to uh, improve uh, food production in our area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. <laughs> Ms. Ismahan Elwafi, Executive Manager of the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Uh, Minister here says, we have our challenges, but here we've seen that there are solutions we can implement. Just your takeaways on the Atoms for Food initiative. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for the invitation. Dr. Grassi. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in the room, but really I have been working with IAA quite closely and with Dr. Najat Mukhtar here when I was chief scientist in FAON before. So for me, really what we need to, to what I am taking from the program, although I didn't listen to all the presentation, is that really it's time to act and it's time to act through science, technologies and innovation. If we look at how, how development has been between 1990 to 2020, that's a span of 30 years, versus how it's going to be in 2020 to 2050, mm -hmm. it's completely different. Between 1990 and 2020, and that's a study by IFPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, we have reduced the number of, of people under the poverty line from 38% to 8%. And in absolute number, we have moved really by a lot. However, we still have about 720 people that are malnourished. We have a huge number of obesity. We have both the triple burden of malnutrition. 
So how are we going to do it in the next years? It has to be different because we did well. The, the approach we used was quite effective. So how was the approach in the past? In the past, the approach was that it was through science and innovation, but there is a huge difference between high-income countries and low-income countries. High-income countries have been able to produce more with less, so what we call the total productivity factor, whereby it's output minus input. And that's what happened in the high-income country. It was very successful. In the low-income country, all the increase of productivity was on clearing new land. So we were not able to produce more with less at a unit. What we did, we cleared new land, we used more natural resources, and that's what we need to change in the next 30 years. 2020, 2050, we need to empower the low and low middle income countries through science and innovation to produce more with less. And that really, I think, it's a very important component that we have to agree to it. How could we do it? We could do it with adoption of technologies because most of the technologies for the low and low middle income countries are way too expensive. So we need to bring the affordability of technologies. We have to work on the policies and regulation. We have to make sure that the farmer has it in their hands. And they think that's where CGR is. CGR, it's the largest publicly funded agricultural research uh, institution across the globe. We have about 10,000 employees, $1 billion per year, invested mostly in our centers that are based in the low and, and low middle income countries, but really, the science and the research needs to, to be done more, but we have also to do more on adoption. We have to do more on really the last mile, bringing that technology in the hand of the, of the farmers. So I think what we need to do is really to be more holistic, more integrated, and much more open in terms of partnership. So partnership in the next 30 years is crucial. Partnership in terms of passing the technology and knowledge, Partnership in terms of working together. There is no single solution. There is no single solution that's going to work. There is no single institution that can do it. There is no single country that can do it. It's only through partnership that we can work together. And I think really a focus on Africa, a focus on South Asia, and a focus on Middle East and North Africa. And that's what the study says. The study says that for the next 30 years, we don't need to increase productivity in most of the high-income countries, nor in China as well. We don't need to increase productivity there. Where we need to increase productivity is in Africa by about 100%, so you need to double it, mm -hmm. in South Asia by about 48%, and in the MENA region that was never part of the priorities worldwide by another 49%. Uh, it's so I think the numbers show us that the path forward is different, and we need to recognize it, and we need to write to put the right partnership, the right model, the right mechanism, and we need private sector, and maybe can touch up on how we bring the partner, the private sector to the low and low middle income countries in the next question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Pam, underscoring the importance for partnership in this regard. Mr. Lloyd Day, you are Deputy Director General at the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Your key thoughts on atoms for food. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Director General, and to your entire staff for the warm welcome and your hospitality. Director General, you began uh, yesterday talking about hope and science. Mm -hmm. Well, we at ICA hope to uh, sign an agreement with you. We hope in January uh, with our Argentine Director General. I'm surrounded by Argentines, Fernando. Nothing, nothing changes. I come all the way to Vienna and I'm surrounded by Argentines. <laughs> but um, um, Director General, we will hopefully discuss the whole array of programs that you have in Adam for food, from water and soil to plant health to animal health and productivity. Um, the agency is not new to us. We administer the Moscomed project in Mexico that Dr. Juarez talked about yesterday. I don't know if she's still here. Um, but that project has enabled Mexico to export tens of billions of dollars of fruits and vegetables to the United States and around the world. And that is one example of your technology helping a country like Mexico share its abundance 
with the rest of the world. And for those of you who have never been to Mexico, please go to Mexico because Mexico is some of the best food in the world. And I'm not kidding. I, of course, you know, it, it, you might burn your tongue a little bit if you have a lot of chili, but the food is absolutely delicious. So, Minister Matos also spoke in the opening ceremonies about Norman Borlaug, and I assume everyone knows who Norman Borlaug. Raise your hands if you know who Norman Borlaug is. All right, not so many. Um, Norman Borlaug is the father of the Green Revolution. He was very important for science and innovation in agriculture. But Norman Borlaug had opportunities because of another guy from Iowa, and I'll bet nobody knows who Henry Wallace is. Does anyone know who Henry Wallace is? We got one. The United States Mission doesn't know Henry Wallace is two out there in the back. So this is going to be a learning moment for many of you. <laughs> Henry Wallace also, like Norman Borlaug, is from Iowa. Henry Wallace, the son of Henry Wallace, who was Secretary of Agriculture, also became Secretary of Agriculture. But very importantly, he was the, the founder of something called hybrid corn. So 100 years ago, there were about 2 billion people on planet Earth, and three innovations happened. Hybrid corn, fertilizer, and the tractor. And that transformed the United States and the rest of the world in terms of abundance. But it also enabled a guy named Norman Borlaug to go to college. Henry Wallace then became the vice president of the United States. And he um, went to Mexico to a place called Simit. Here's a book from Simit, uh, a CGIR uh, system. Uh, so he went there in the 1940s in order to help Mexico with something called wheat stem rust. It was 15 years of innovation. And that innovation came strains from Japan, strains from, there was someone here from Kenya, that eventually that strain from Kenya was rescued from a fire, went to Texas A&M, I think. Uh, there he is, Texas A&M over there. So all that helped develop the wheat variety of a dwarf wheat from Mexico that saved the world, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize. So that's an example of science helping agriculture. What you're doing here at this agency is phenomenal. And I think working with us and working with Minister Matos from Uruguay, the president of our 34 ministers, we're going to have the opportunity to help you share this technology with the Americas. It's not something that everyone thinks about. And sometimes people are afraid of it. But we had some great examples here. We had a, an example from one, one of our member states from Jamaica yeah. uh, about how we've helped the ginger industry. So with that, we're going to embrace science, working with you to share this technology around the world. And we're very, very grateful for your invitation. Thank you, Mr. Day. Ms. Katie Cormier, I'll come to you now. You're chief of the Food Safety Division in the Center for Nutrition at USAID. Your key takeaways, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of this distinguished uh, group. And, um, and I'm, I'm happy to share some key takeaways uh, with, with, the, with this packed room. Um, I, you know, I'm also, um, I also want to acknowledge that I understand that this year does represent a key moment, a call to action. It's, it's not um, uh, common for the IAEA meeting to focus on food, and, and that's actually why, why I'm here. But I think that we really can't, um, we can't overstate how um, food safety has just recently become a development imperative. I mean, really, we're talking within the last five years. And so the fact that this community is already mobilized um, to be part of increasing the momentum, keeping the momentum going at a time when the African Union um, is, um, is showing real leadership um, on food safety, driving uh, objectives within the Africa um, Free and Continental um, Trade Agreement um, and the post malabo Cadup agenda is really exciting. So I just want to acknowledge that. But I, I'm here because um, food security is, uh, is a top priority of the US government. The agency that I work for, USAID, in partnership with the State Department and 12 other agencies and departments, uh, advances the Feed the Future initiative. This is a US government initiative to uh, reduce hunger, poverty, and malnutrition. We partner with over 20 priority countries to build inclusive, resilient, and sustainable food systems that deliver safe, nutritious food, healthy diets. So that, that's really the ambition. Um, I was reflecting on what I heard yesterday, uh, in particular, um, listening to the expert uh, presentations. 
And some of the key themes came out included um, applications of nuclear technology to addressing agriculture and food security challenges like reducing food loss and waste, addressing food safety risks, extending shelf life of nutritious food, facilitating food trade, reducing pests and diseases. These are really important issues. The Feed the Future initiative has been working um, since 2010 to address, um, to address agriculture and food security challenges. We've, received, we've achieved some really critical results in stunting and poverty reduction, economic growth. However, the, the topics that I was just mentioning are seriously underinvested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So um, my neighbor here, CG director, you know, the, yes, we need to see increases in agricultural productivity and a lot of these post farm gate spaces that so many of you are looking at really need a lot of attention. So that's a key takeaway of mine, is that there really is a lot of potential. So in my role overseeing a food safety portfolio, growing food safety portfolio um, within, within USAID, um, there, there's really potential for atoms for food. Um, I understand, and I, and I see a, how it dovetails with the Feed the Future initiative. This is a all hands on deck moment for combating global hunger. And you know we recognize that Adams for Food uh, is um, is a joint collaboration between FAO and IAEA. Uh, it's building on many years of engagement, uh, leveraging resources and expertise um, to enhance um, food safety and food security. So it's really, really, really critical. And again, I use the word a mo word moment. I mean, I think this is a really important moment. I want to underscore some of the things that others have said um, about the importance of tailoring innovative technical solutions to country context. Um, I think one of the one of the speakers already mentioned. There's no one size fits all. I think it might have been um, DJ Grossi. No one size. There's not one size fits all. We really have to tailor um, solutions. And it's also important to support, at the same time, the development of, um, of infrastructure that enables uptake and scaling. Um, so in infrastructure such as education, laws and policies were mentioned, um, regulatory oversight, uh, all important. And now, on behalf of the US government, um, it's, it is my privilege to announce a new allocation of, um, of up to $1.07 million in, in funding um, under the Peaceful Uses Initiative for uh, IAEA research to apply um, radiation-induced mutagenesis to the cowpea crop, which is a really important food crop in Africa. Specifically, um, this funding will support uh, the identity of um, the identification of climate resilient strains of cowpea in partnership with IATA and the CG and researchers in, in Namibia and in Zambia. And we're going to continue to collaborate on new applications. So I'll just I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cormier. <laughs> Mr. Herman Guido Laval, you're president of the National Commission on Atomic Energy in Argentina, so Atoms for Food is right up your alley. It is, thank you. And um, I would like to thank the IAEA for this initiative, in particular the, the DG and his staff that we are called, we nuclear men and women are called to work on some of the most important issues, the food and health that humanity is facing. Particularly, the issue of food is, of course, our job to be there under the one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is the Zero Hunger Initiative. So we are called here to make our part of the of, of this business. And we are eager to share our experience with all member countries. And I would like to mention a couple of things and facts that are going on in Argentina. Firstly, in last December, we signed an MOU between our Ministry of Bioeconomy, Ministry of Economy, and when with the IAEA when the DG went to our country. That's an important milestone, and it it is aimed to strengthen what we are doing, particularly in food irradiation, pest control, and techniques that we've been using for several years now. Second topic that has been already mentioned is the networking, but not only between different countries, but within the country. You just mentioned the, I, I don't know, seven or eight different agencies working on a topic. Well, we have to 
share to partner with the other agencies in our country, the Ministry of Agriculture, of Agriculture, the Secretary of Bioeconomy, we have different, and that's part of our job, to partner with them and to offer what we have to, to what we may put on the table to, to help this effort. And, but we also face some important challenges that we are working on. First is we need some new legislation, a framework in order to continue irradiation, food and, and pest control that we are working on. We also need to acquire new technology. We have a, a, a pest irradiation facility for many years now with the support of the IAEA TC. It has had important progress in the eradication of the Mediterranean fruit flower in some regions of Argentina, but we have new pests every year, different pests. Last year was particularly important because the, the, the crop was severely affected in last January, and that's an economic problem for all the country. And we have also to introduce some new technology. We are relying on irradiation from Cobalt sources, and we have to go also into e beam technology, X ray, and other new technologies that you are offering us, the ones that have to manage these things to have a better world. So, thank you, the IAEA again, and all of you that he has been participating in this forum. It is important to put on the table the new technology that you are developing and thinking each day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavallo. Uh, Mr. Prihatso Setianto, you are a senior executive advisor to the Minister of Agriculture in Indonesia. Your takeaway, sir. First of all, I would like to say thank you uh, to the Director General of IAEA for this, for uh, inviting us, the Indonesian Minister of Agriculture, to attend this wonderful meeting. Uh, Indonesia is a very large country is the population is around 281 million population where 125 millions of this population works as a farmers and around 80 to 90 percent of these farmers are small holders farmers so we are working with atomic uh, uh, nuclear uh, technology maybe for almost uh, 40 years now, and we produce around 50 varieties, uh, uh, consists of rice, mung beans, soybeans, and other uh, crops. Nuclear technology offers the potential to increase crop productivity and food quality. However, we must ensure that this innovation remains economically accessible to both farmers and consumers. Technology is only as powerful as its reach. And for Indonesia agriculture sector, it is crucial that these advancements are affordable to the needs of small-scale farmers who form the backbone of Indonesia food system. Indonesia Food Support Initiative aimed at promoting the use of nuclear technology in agriculture. However, we also recognize that public trust in these technologies is a must. For this reason, we are committed to assuring the public about the safety of nuclear application in agriculture. So I would like to, uh, this morning I have a call from my uh, friends, my, 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 my best friend. So what are you doing in Austria? So she is a PhD scholar, and I told him that I'm talking about atoms for food. And the immediate question from this friend, my friends, he told me, is it safe? Mm. It is good for the metabolism. So you can imagine what the people react about this. So because if you talk about nuclear technology yeah if you talk about nuclear technology as i mentioned that 80 90% of indonesia 
uh, farmer uh, Indonesia farmers is a smallholder farmers. If you talk about nuclear technology, the farmers will set back to 79 years ago, where the first atomic bomb yeah, destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, and this still in dirty minds. So how to convince the people to give the public trust is, I think is something that we should all uh, talk about this. So this is some message that I would like to mention in this, in this forum as uh, the Director General mentioned, what are the problems? So probably one of the problems is that how to convince the people that this energy, this nuclear energy is safe. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Setianto. <laughs> Deputy Minister Diko, I, I have a question for you. Um, you did a, you explained to us how vulnerable Burkina Faso and other Sahel countries are uh, to, to the effects of climate change. And as we look at this Atoms for Food initiative specifically, could you please just share an idea for us about how this can really support a country uh, like Burkina Faso. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, Atom for Food is an initiative which is uh, integral, which uh, uh, talk about animal production and uh, vegetable production. So uh, it's very welcome in uh, our area. Uh, yesterday I hear here about what you did with cassava in uh, Ghana. Yes. It is what we want in uh, our country. We have uh, five area, three areas where we, uh, we need uh, atom for food to help us. Uh, in the uh, area of uh, crop increasing, we, we did uh, 11 crop with uh, uh, your agency, and we want, it is in uh, experimentation now, and we need uh, the help of uh, the agency to implement it uh, in uh, a farmer in, in farms to increase uh, uh, rice production and in our area we have a lack of uh, water and uh, we hope that uh, atom for food will help us to manage very well uh, water to uh, uh, make production of uh, food. And in animal genetic, we, uh, we also work with uh, your agency to improve uh, animal uh, production. So we have a atom for food is a, a hope of, of, uh, for us because as you know, we have a lot of problem and uh, atom for food can be the solution to improve uh, animal production and uh, vegetable production and uh, in few months, we'll uh, have a call with uh, your agency to s s a view how we will uh, implement atom for food in uh, our country. And we hope uh, at the uh, next uh, scientific forum, yes. we'll present something that was helpful for people uh, in area of uh, rice production. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy yeah. Minister. Mr. Day, I'll come to you at this juncture because, oh, please hold your applause uh, for, for the end. Um, there is the, the aspect of how the Atoms for Food initiative really does provide uh, a platform for tailor-made solutions to, to the respective countries, as we've heard Deputy Minister uh, just tell us there from the perspective of Burkina Faso. Just your views on that, please. Well, I think I'm still learning a lot about the opportunity from drought tolerance to you know, controlling insects to maybe assistance with the soil. And so in any country, I think, you know, th there's no one size fits all, as has already been mentioned. And I think that's an important thing, not just for trade, but for the applications of technologies in different parts of the world. In the short term, uh, one of the things that, two of the things that I thought were very important for us is we've dealt with the Mediterranean fruit, fruit fly in Mexico. Uh, we currently have something called the screw worm that is moving up from Panama to Costa Rica to Nicaragua to Honduras and is on Mexico's doorstep. 
in Argentina and and in lots of South America, it's there. But there was a there was a barrier called the Darien Gap, which no longer exists. Uh, and there's a lot of migration coming through. And so with animals and humans and everything else, that that pest is moving north, and that can have a huge impact on the uh, on on livestock. And livestock is a huge component of agriculture, not just in the Americas, but around the world. And so to the extent that we can use the technology that comes out of this agency and deploy that in a variety of countries in order to help prevent this outbreak and to stop it in its tracks, like we did many years ago, 20 years ago, uh, that's really something important. And then one of our colleagues from Malaysia spoke about Fusarium race 4, TR4 as it's known, that is you know, destroying banana plantations around the world. It arrived into Colombia several years ago, right before COVID. And then everything kind of died down, but it has spread rapidly in the Americas. And if there are solutions that are being developed here that we can use alongside other types of uh, solutions that might come from gene editing or biotechnology or just plant breeding, whatever tools we have in order to attack that disease in order so that we can have a banana in the morning or at night or whenever you have it uh, is really important. And it's not just important for us as consumers. It's important for the farmers around the world of the banana crop. That is the fifth most important crop in the world. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Yep. So however we can work together to address that, I think is important too. So those are just two thoughts I had. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Day. Ms. Eluafi, if we can just talk a little bit about the, the partnership as it pertains to resource mobilization uh, in, in R&D as well as in food and agriculture, if you could just share a thought on that. So there is no doubt that we need more funding for, for science and research for development at large. But I think sometimes it's not so much the money, it's really the impact. And that's where we have, we need more resources, absolutely. And I think all countries should strive to achieve 3% GDP in science and innovation. And we know that only few countries are able to do it so far, including least income countries. I think countries in the South should invest as well. But also it's about partnership and where do we put our eggs? Where do we emphasize? Where we do we put focus? And here I wanna really uh, commend the Atom for Food the initiative because we know about the nuclear technologies in many areas, but I think bringing all of them together and I, as, as an ex-FAO chief scientist, uh, I love the, the labs. I always say FAO does not do science except in the joint division with IAA where we, you, FAO does science. And really the areas that, and I don't know how many of you visited the lab, they are excellent. One of the areas that I love, and I see the, the lead scientist here, it's really how with nuclear technologies you can, you can see the movement of a carbon, of a nitrogen atom. It's wonderful because also, even if we do, we understand nature, we don't understand it. And most of the Nobel Prizes people and all the scientists will tell you, we hardly know 1%. So there is a lot of knowledge that is not yet there. And I think circularity and movement of atoms and how ocean interfere or interact with the water cycles on land. There is a lot of things we don't know. And what's happening with climate change, it's just multiplying by a thousand times the urgency. So I think we need to invest more in all sciences, basic science, fundamental science, uh, applied science, development science. And that's where development science mm -hmm. gets us into bringing it in the hand of the people, the whole cycle. The same when we talk about the agri-food system, it's the whole system. It's not, you don't do production without post-harvest. You don't do diseases without doing nutrition. It's all together. The solutions are in multiple, but they are all interacting, and I always, wonder, I always love the example of soils. We think soils are dead. They are not dead. In soils, you got millions of microorganisms, and they are all interacting with each other. The fact that we don't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And the fact that we don't understand it, we won't be able to produce more with less. So there's a huge areas where we need to focus. One of them is climate change adaptation. The other one, it's definitely soil. Nutrition, it's a, big, it's a big question mark. And luckily, we have a huge initiative by Rockefeller called PTFI, Periodic Table of Food Initiative, that is really helping us to get there. And there is a number of areas that we are not discerning. So, and that's why I go back to partnership. 
So it's not FAO alone, it's not IAA alone, right. it's not CGR alone, it's not every country alone. It's bringing networks of networks of science and innovation partners to find the right solution for the right context. Copy yes. paste doesn't work, and we need really to customize those solutions for every ecosystem and every country and every market. Thank you. And I do want my other speakers to speak on partnership, but staying on resource mobilization, if I can come to you, Ms. Cormier, your perspectives on engaging the private sector and other partners towards scaling. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, scaling. <laughs> so within the, uh, we've heard a lot about that. You know, there are lo lots of, um, lots of examples that have a lot of promise and we want to see those replicated because we know they're part of the solution, but how do we get there? Um, and investment and resources are limited, um, but there's a lot of investment potential. So with, within the Feed the Future initiative, which I mentioned again, started in 2010, we've spent a lot of time thinking about commercialization of agricultural technologies. And why did we do that? Because because the the billion dollars a year that Congress has you had the U.S. Congress has appropriated to the um, to this this U.S. government initiative, a lot of it went towards research and um, developing new technologies, and then several years after the initiative started, we realized that while we can count over a thousand new technologies, for example not many of them have been commercialized. Not many of them are, are being used. And so we really had to take a hard look at, at what was going on and spent um, some time reflecting on, a, um, on a, a scalability assessment tool. And I'm happy to share this because I think that as Adams for Food um, kicks off and, um, and reflects on how to scale some really promising technologies related to nuclear technology, this tool has the potential to, to support some of what, um, what I know um, you're trying to accomplish. One of the things that um, that it, it championed, and I know CG has been part of this effort, is taking a look at the nature of the good to try to understand, does it require, is it largely a, a public, uh, does it require public resources, private resources, or, or a hybrid version? And then there's a whole process that starts at the very beginning, that's, the, that's what we encourage, at the very beginning of, um, of uh, development, stakeholder consultation, so that includes the private sector, mm -hmm. and it includes civil society groups, and it includes a gender-inclusive um, composition of stakeholders uh, to um, right from the beginning. And why is this important for an initiative like Adams for Food? Because mm -hmm. nuclear technologies are competing for the attention, or are competing with other technologies. So if you really want to see uptake of these technologies, it's important that that those who you want to um, use these technologies are part of those conversations from the beginning because there are other um, technologies that they're considering. So these are this is a competitive market place, and um, and I don't think I need to <laughs> to go into why you know just because it's a good idea it it really it, the challenge is you want those resources those limited resources to really have have an impact. So bringing those stakeholders in right up front really is important. But I wanted to make one more point, and that is around. Um, so anyway, so, so key, pre, key, the key principles, multi-stakeholder, gender inclusive, local, um, private sector. But one more point, and this just came to me. So the, the, this idea that, that this, this week is a call to action. Yeah. I was at the Africa Food Systems Forum a couple of weeks ago, and I think at least the first three of us were there together. We didn't even meet each other there, <laughs> but we were all there together. It's a big meeting like this. And I, but I had the pleasure of working um, with um, on the youth dome. All right, so youth. I wanted to mention youth. Who feels the most sense of urgency really when it comes to climate change and and solutions to to the climate challenges? Well, those that identify as youth feel it really deeply, and they're also some of the most innovative and and. If, with, if given potential, they're gonna be really part of this scaling effort and bringing resources to bear. So I did wanna encourage um, those of you leading Adams for Food to reflect on how you bring youth into the conversation yeah. right away. Um, and reflect on mentorship, working with students, they are the future. So, if you, so just uh, you know, reflect on that. I, I think this is an important part of the solution. Ms. Cormier, thank you. Uh, Mr. Setianto, I want to come to you now. Um, could you just share with us the ways in which the integration of nuclear sciences 
particularly in mutation breeding and has transformed agriculture in Indonesia and how you've benefited from these yeah. innovations? Yeah, uh, as I uh, mentioned, we, are, we uh, do not doubt about the nuclear technology for the mutation breeding. As I mentioned, that we have more than 50 varieties of crops, yeah, con consists of uh, rice, mung beans, soybeans, tropical wheat, etc. So uh, we have calculated that uh, these crops we already established uh, within 10 years around 2.5 million hectares in Indonesia. So yeah, I think this is uh, something that we should go through. Yeah, about this uh, initiative on uh, producing more varieties yeah. from uh, the nuclear technology. Thank you. Thank you. And next to you, Mr. Laval, um, the perspective of partnership um, has really come out strongly in, in our conversations. And could you share the role that your organization is playing, the National Commission uh, on Atomic Energy in Argentina, uh, to sort of foster cooperation, south to south, and triangular cooperation? Uh, thank you. Yes, as was mentioned, uh, this is not a local problem. So it, the, for the, the example we've been given of the pest spreading, f even through what we consider natural barriers, well, that is not actually happening. So this uh, collaboration between countries is very important. So this is not a local problem. It's also important, well, was mentioned, that the uh, technology be delivered to people that can implement that. Yes. So that's also a second kind of partnership that is needed. And I've also mentioned the uh, partnership or the interaction, the networking between different agencies at the government. Many of us work for different governments and always have some problems. No, this belongs to this agency or to this ministry and have problems moving moving papers around. So partnership is important in different levels and in different directions. So I, I strongly think that the interaction also between agencies is very important. Thank you for that. Uh, Minister, you, you said that leadership is also an important part of this. Um, but I wondered if you could share with us what, what you think, Minister Masuka, would make the Atoms for Food initiative a success going forward. Well, thank you very much. Let me be more context-specific and speak about Zimbabwe and uh, look at the, what we call the agriculture food systems and rural transformation strategy, which we put together a while ago. And, and, um, saying that we want food security, food sovereignty, and we have a dual agriculture system, the smallholder, 70% of the population daily egg they are living from agriculture. So it is agriculture that must power them out of poverty towards uh, prosperity. And then we have a large scale commercial sector. But in the context of that, we have climate change, increasing population, urbanization. And we're seeing uh, the most conservative uh, estimates now indicate a 30% reduction in rain-fed maize production by 2050. And by that time, we'll have doubled the population, so we'll need to feed more people from reduced land. So we're not looking at the horizontal increase as a result of more area being brought into production. We're looking at vertical increase in production, which is yield. But that best is based on viability, profitability, and sustainability of farming. So we've now adopted two aspects. We said that we needed um, sustainable, intensive conservation agriculture at the smallholder level. And in the context of climate change, it means we need varieties that are more drought tolerant, that are more uh, tolerant to pests and diseases. And uh, our starch in Zimbabwe and the rest of Southern Africa is based on maize and traditional grains and millets. So we will need atoms for food to assist us to rapidly screen new varieties that are adapted to the drier environment, but also that make it profitable. The reason why most of uh, farmers in Zimbabwe do not produce millets on a commercial basis because the yields are too low, to one, two tons per hectare. So it is in the business. So we need atoms for food to assist us 
in this area so that we can make progress. And if we can use these traditional varieties, it means we will also have solved the nutrition aspect. In many respects, maize meal has to be fortified with vit vitamin A, and whereas all these traditional grains are naturally biofortified. So we will be able to accomplish quite a lot if we are able to use uh, mutation breeding to select varieties that are higher yielding, more drought and pest tolerant. There is also an increasing threat for maize production in Zimbabwe and the rest of Southern Africa in that way fall armyworm introduced in 2016, but it is now impossible, even at smallholder level, to produce maize without chemicals. And if many of the chemicals, the uh, insects are becoming resistant, so we now have to rotate them in seasons, we have to do seed dressings. If we can bring in atoms for food, uh, to bring in uh, maybe the sterile insect technique and other uh, interventions, we could try and reduce and eventually eliminate this pest and make maize production more profitable again at smallholder level. But I see that this is the focus on crops. There must also be similar focus on livestock. With climate change, it means that uh, we need atoms for food to be able to look at indigenous breeds yes. that are better adapted to what we do because 90% of the livestock in Zimbabwe is in smallholder hands. We will not only look at this as their socio-economic status in the African context, but also to become a business, it means that we need to look at uh, better breeds that are better adapted to this drier environment. And the last thing that I see on the horizon in terms of climate change and the challenge, threat, and perhaps intervention uh, with atoms for food is that uh, we have Tsetsefly, which we have uh, largely eliminated and is confined to one small area now. But with climate change, it means the whole of Zimbabwe will now be ecologically possible for this insect to thrive again. So it means that we have uh, the surveillance aspects, uh, the vigilance aspects, and the atoms for food can bring in the tools that are required to ensure that we enhance our surveillance skills and uh, ensure that uh, the people are able to continue to produce and uh, have livestock as a business in this area. So there's so much potential that atoms for food can bring about. I therefore look forward to Perhaps I, I was talking to the Director General earlier in the morning and thank you for seeing uh, us uh, that early and saying that uh, we want to be a part of this initiative, Atoms for Food, to ensure that we can make progress and progress where it is required best at household level, at village level, to transform these lives through Atoms for Food. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, <laughs> I think that's the perfect segue to come back to you, uh, Director General, because um, we've heard, in fact, in one of the presentations, a point was made that partnership um, and leadership can really be fostered really well by our UN agencies, bringing us together. And we, we want that leadership from the IAEA. And just to get your final remarks as we bring our forum to a close uh, this year, how you also see how the Atoms for Food initiative can be sustainable going forward. Well, indeed, thank you very much. I've been... Uh listening, of course, uh, with a lot of uh, interest, avidly, to what has been said here. And if there's something I can uh, take with me after uh, what we discussed yesterday and today, and, and even in this um, uh, round table here, or round circle um, here, is that, of course, um, uh, this is, a, like you were saying, this is a moment, this is a special moment, uh, and a moment where we need to recognize how best to put uh, our own capacities into, into this. Atoms of Food um, is, uh, and this is why we are bringing people li like you, uh, we are all about practical projects. This is us. Um, we need the, um, the R&D, we need uh, the strategic thinking. We need the global uh, uh, agencies that are present all over the world. We need the regional partners that can lead us better uh, on, on how to help. But let me say that we are this, we are a humble implementer of concrete projects. When the minister is telling me, and, and, and of course, uh, 
the deputy minister and, and my colleagues all over the world um, what is needed. And this is what the agency can bring. This is exactly what we can bring. Um, uh, you were talking about yields. I, in Pakistan, we increased almost 200% the yield of basmati rice and long uh, grain rice. The cassava example I gave uh, uh, about uh, Ghana, livestock in Botswana, we rescued the export uh, sector in Botswana, which is exporting, as you know, better, much better than me, uh, beef. So I think that uh, for us, the big challenge, and, and this is why we need all of you, is to um, catalyze and to uh, transform all this thinking, all this uh, prognosis into very modest, concrete projects that go places and does stuff. This is exactly what we need to do. And we have seen it. I was uh, freeing mosquitoes in Recife. I was uh, with, with the local communities where, with the favelas. Uh, the people are involved. What, the peop what do the people need? They, they need institutions that go and do the thing, and we need the financing to do this. And again, and thank you very much for the announcement of this contribution that you are making, because this is exactly what we need. Uh, we uh, know how to do the things, and we uh, are there to do it. Um, one of the frustrations we, at, at, at times, we we have had um, is that still um, a little bit like your friend that was you know, saying that uh, atoms. What is this atomic people working in this? Uh, the develop the international development community does not yet recognize what the IAEA can do and is doing. Um, and this, if uh, you allow me to say, uh, and I will leave the food sector for a second, it happens to me in nuclear medicine and cancer. It is the same. We are doing the radiotherapy stuff. And then people, and very important people, I'm not talking about people in the streets. I'm talking about governmental Officers, they, uh, you know, innocently and very nicely, they say, oh, I didn't know that you were doing this. So this and, uh, is, is the issue, and it's about information, and it's about what we are doing here together, letting people know. I don't get angry with the people, I get angry with myself. How is it possible that people do not know that we are doing these things, that we are capable of bringing this science to um, you know what I do sometimes with uh, skeptical politicians? I take them to Cybersdorf. I take them to the labs. Because they see there how different we are in the sense that we are doing the science, but not the science for the research and development, which is indispensable. And we take it from whatever it is. It is the science to train our teams and to send them out. Like we send out inspectors to check that there are no nuclear weapons around the world. This is the essence. This is the philosophy. You know, uh, an easy quip would be to say how much, you know, uh, food for thought we, talk, we took from here. I would say it's the other way around. This is thought, but for food. Yeah. It's the other way around. So I want to thank you all for having, you know, uh, answered the call, for being here. And like the deputy minister was saying, let's see in a few months what is the impact? What did we get yeah. from the year? How many projects? Uh, what are we doing in Zimbabwe? And you said, I want to be part. OK, the bar should be at, uh, and the parameter and the performance indicator, as the experts say, will be what, we, that, what, did you, what did we do? What did we do in this country? And the examples are there. These are not promises in the air. The examples are there for all of us, those who care, to see. What are the figures? What we have achieved in, 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 in different countries? So um, again, to thank you all for being here. Um, Atoms for Food um, is a reality, but we need uh, all of you to help us, to support us, and to also help us convince others. Because without it, I'm not going to make it. We are not going to make it uh, alone. There are billions floating around the world uh, around the issue of food 
and the IAEA is not getting to the three-figure level, all right, on this. This is how low we are, in spite of the results we are bringing to the table. And I know there's a lot of goodwill out there. So it's a matter of connecting, connecting communities, connecting, connecting agencies, connecting the goodwill that exists uh, out there, and try to make things a little bit better if we can. I am sure we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Deputy uh, or Director General uh, Grossi. Thank you, Minister Masuka. Thank you, Deputy Minister Diko, Ms. Elufe, Mr. Day, uh, Ms. Cormier, Mr. Laval, and Mr. Setianto. Thank you very much for your inputs in this session. And that really does bring uh, a close to the scientific forum. Thank you to everybody else, to all our speakers, our organizers, uh, and everybody who's helped make our scientific forum a success this year, your contribution, your participation. I don't want to forget those who've been joining us virtually as well. Let's take the message out there now. Thank you very much, everybody. And we look forward to bringing us back together next year, uh, DG. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.